Welcome to Wasm Assembly episode 5. After Ryan Hunt from Mozilla in the last episode, in today's episode, I again have someone from Google on the show, Francis McCabe. Francis works on the WebAssembly team at Google and is the co-inventor of the Go exclamation mark programming language, a multi-paradigm programming language that is oriented to the needs of programming secure, production quality, agent-based applications. It's a multi-threaded, strongly, strongly typed, and higher order in the programming functional programming sense language. Welcome to the show, Francis. All right. Yeah, so Francis, um, we should probably clarify, and this has caused a lot of confusion in the past, that your language, Go exclamation mark, is not Go um, without the exclamation mark. <laughs> right. Back then, uh, you were with Fujitsu Lab, uh, Labs of America, and um, after arguing with Google about the name for a bit, you actually joined Google and made your peace with the company in uh, 2017. And um, you then moved into the WebAssembly standards team in 2018. Can you just tell us a little bit about um, yeah, what you did um, before, how you got into WebAssembly, how you got into Google, um, just for you, um, just for people to get to know you a little bit more? So, you know, the Go, the Go, the Go frac the frackers, if that's the right word. Uh, at the time, I had no idea that I'd be eventually joining Google. Um, I, I did have a conversation with Rob Pike about the name. Um, and, you know, he he told me about the, some of the motivation behind the Go Lang design. I didn't appreciate it at the time. It's certainly true. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I joined Google in seven, 2017. And, you know, I was kind of aware of the irony of all of that. <laughs> I originally joined the Gmail team working on on anti-abuse uh, effort, but then the opportunity to join WebAssembly came up. I had actually heard about WebAssembly beforehand, before I joined Google, so I was very interested in joining the WebAssembly effort, and I was also very interested in the standardization aspect of it. So when the opportunity came, I grabbed it. Gotcha. So from, from the Golang, uh, Golang language, um, to WebAssembly, is there a path? Can you can you compile Go exclamation mark to WebAssembly? Well, f first of all, uh, on the Go Bang uh, name, it's a logic programming language, so it's kind of very, very, very different to most other programming la languages. Um, and I did a lot of work on it, uh, but I stopped working on it um, around the time that I joined Google, not because I joined Google, but around that time. Gotcha. There's a sort of a bytecode compiler that is still available on GitHub, um, but I haven't worked on it for quite a while. And you, and if you want to run it in WebAssembly, you can, but you have to. It's basically you're interpreting it. All right. So luckily, you didn't burn any bridges back then when the names clashed. Um, right. But uh, yeah, you joined Google in 2017, as I said before, then um, went into the standards team, and now these days, uh, most people probably know you for your work on JSPI, the JavaScript Promise Integration, yeah. into WebAssembly. So JavaScript developers, um, of course, these days are very, very familiar with um, promises. They used to fetch API all the time and fetch returns a promise. So they know that eventually something will be coming. But for now, it's a promise. Um, JSPI allows WebAssembly apps that were written assuming synchronous access that were, um, yeah, asynchronous access to functionality to operate smoothly in an environment where um, this functionality is um, asynchronous. So in CSC++, as an example, you have the read method that blocks until a read actually has happened. Um, on the web, if you block the main thread, that's, of course, a total no-go. But um, yeah, can you give us just some more examples of how WebAssembly applications and uh, like I guess the underlying C, C++ applications in the most cases have assumptions about something being synchronous? Oh, well... There's many of those. I mean, there's all the I/O stuff. So read, uh, write. Right, right, right. The the <clears throat> to be honest, the you know programming against a synchronous model is much easier than programming against an asynchronous model. You know, because you, you're in some when you when you when you when you're you've called some function and you're waiting for the answer. This is the right time. This is the right place in your code to get the answer. So. 
so even if a C++ had, I mean, it does have some primitives for, primitives is not the right word, but it does have some features that allow you to program asynchronously. There are things like completion handlers, for example. But uh, generally, programming synchronously is much easier, much less cognitive burden for the programmer. So even if this wasn't an issue for C for the legacy applications, which are mostly written against synchronous, it would still be a beneficial feature for for the programmer. You know, I've had tried various ways of explaining uh, how this works, and I think one of the, the the more recent ways I'm thinking about it now is that. It's it's like you can it's like building an a, an async function a JavaScript async function whose body is actually C plus plus. That's another way of thinking about it. So from from a JavaScript point of view, you're just calling an async function, and it works, and you get your promise, and you can wait on that promise and all the rest of it. <clears throat> but the inside of that function is actually a C++ or WebAssembly function more generally. That's, that's, um, that's, I think that's, that may be the most natural way of thinking about it. I don't know. I'll keep trying different, different ways in. Yeah, so the, the way the explainer um, explains it is that uh, JSPA works in a way that it intercepts promise objects returned by asynchronous web API functions like fetch, for example, and then suspends the WebAssembly application. That's right, yeah. And then when the asynchronous I.O. operation is completed, the WebAssembly application is resumed. So yeah. that's for the theory, but can you go into just a little bit more detail on what this actually means in practice, how it works, what it does, what does what does suspend technically mean? What that mean? That's on one side. On the other side, you know, what? how much of your application is suspended? Uh, everything up to the original call into WebAssembly from JavaScript. So you have some call into JavaScript, and that and that calls WebAssembly, and all of that code is suspended. And what will happen is that uh, eventually the promise will be resolved, and the the, the browser's event loop will be, will wake you up again, and you'll re-enter the WebAssembly. But of course, the original context is gone too. The original call context is gone. So what will happen is that when your application finally finishes, the promise that was originally part of that call, that's the promise. That's where it gets back into your application. That promise is resolved with the result of your WebAssembly application, the WebAssembly call. So from from JavaScript, it looks like you're calling a function that was going to return a promise. The the promise's value comes from running the WebAssembly, and will eventually and it, you will event and eventually the the browser will 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 wake up that promise, so the JavaScript can pick it up again. So again, so that so when you when when the WebAssembly is suspended, then that whole Promise resolving code. That's the that's the that's the function that uh, is suspended. So just to clarify, um, it works in both directions, right? So you can call from JavaScript into WebAssembly and the other way around. Yeah. And um, this will then be asynchronous in both cases, even if the original code had synchronous um, assumptions. There are a couple of extras here. So if you if you are calling if you call a norm if you're in WebAssembly and you call a normal JavaScript function that's not going to wait right if you it, it, it's it's only specially marked imports that will will result in the suspension so if you call a normal JavaScript then you're just going to get the value as normal um, and also the same WebAssembly module can have various exports. You can either you can have some exports which are, are wrapped as, as promise bearing and others that are not. Uh, so that that all works as well. And then the final thing here is that when you are suspended, so if you call if you call uh, if you call into WebAssembly using the promise integration, and that code ends up being suspended, then your JavaScript uh, application can continue, right? You, it's got a promise, but it can do other things. 
Uh, and in particular, what can happen is that you're, you can be re-entered into the WebAssembly. Uh, so then you can have multiple you can have multiple um, activities going on in flight in in that sense. Although it's not parallel, only one thing can be running at any one time. Understood. So, for example, if you've got a JavaScript application uh, where where if the user clicks a button, the image is loaded. And you could have it so that the image is that before the Im the image is loaded because what the button actually does is call into WebAssembly, and the WebAssembly calls into the fetch. Um, so, uh, so the user will click, could click multiple times, and you get multiple activities going on in flight. This does have a, a caveat that your WebAssembly application had better be aware of this, but this is not something that we can control. So. If you if you got multiple image uh, fetches going on in flight simultaneously, and they will come back as they come back normally, all right. So, if if the if the order of resolution was different to the order of clicking, then that will also show up in your application. So your your WebAssembly code has to be somewhat uh, somewhat aware of being re-entered in this way. Yeah, so um, let's talk about the marking uh, in just a little bit, um, because it comes probably closer to when we talk about the way this works in practice. So um, the the way this works is um, that you need to wrap your code into um, promising and suspender. Can we talk about uh, briefly about the performance impact that this will have? Like, how much slower does this make the code? Well, it doesn't change the performance of the WebAssembly code at all. all right? It doesn't change WebAssembly at all. So however fast or slow your WebAssembly was, it continues at the same speed. There is some small overhead in, um, in sort of entering into, into that world. All right? so the, but that's a constant time overhead. And there's another overhead... Um, where especially if you if your WebAssembly call function calls JavaScript non non suspending JavaScript calls, there's going to be some penalty there as well, because we cannot uh, we cannot afford to have um, we cannot afford to have uh, uh, particularly we cannot afford to have C code or browser code uh, be running. Uh, uh, on these extra uh, extra suspended uh, stacks, I'll come back into what that means in a second. So there is some slight overhead uh, when you're calling non when you're calling non suspending functions from your from your WebAssembly. Um, but other than that, it's only constant time overhead, right? There's no there's no we're not changing the code. We're not changing the JavaScript. We're not changing the, the WebAssembly code. So what actually happens is that when you call into one of these wrapped uh, WebAssembly uh, code, it, the, the, the function is run on a new stack. We create a new stack for it, and we run it on that stack. But from the WebAssembly point of view, this is just like normal. It doesn't know that it's running on a new stack. OK, so that's good to know. So we only talk about linear um, performance slowdowns and uh, like constant um, slowdowns, which is, I guess, in this case, really good news. Cool. Um, so I want to quickly talk about the standardization of JSPI and where we are. So right now, the proposal is at stage three. Yeah. Um, where are we headed in the directory? How, how was it so far? Um, there was also some name change um, where we went from suspender to suspending, and we talk about this in, in a couple of minutes when we look into how to actually use that. But like, what was the story so far? How how did it um, yeah land in the standards uh, community? So we've been working on this on JSPI for a couple of years now, and there's been uh, there's been some. Uh, there's been some refinement of the of the usage model, I would say. So originally, um, <clears throat> originally we thought we we thought we needed some some extra precision in how we used uh, JSPI, and that's and that's the original API that we developed for it reflected that extra precision. But it turns out that we don't need that precision. 
And so we simplified the API. Uh, the vote. It's interesting. The vote to simplify the API occurred in January this year, but it took more than six months for everything to roll out. It's only now the uh, well, a couple of months ago the new API was made available for in Chrome, uh, and so it's, it'll in a couple of months' time the old API will be completely gone. So it took a long time for all of that to work through the system, but it wasn't too, due to any internal implementation. It's simply making sure that we, we respect the user. Makes sense. Um, so when you say precision, um, can you go into more detail? What, what do you mean there? Like, where, where is the precision not? Needed? So when you, when you call into uh, a promise-bearing, what I would call a promise-bearing WebAssembly applet function, okay, <clears throat> the... The question, and then you suspend, the question arises, how much do you suspend? And originally we had it so that there was a special, you had a special token, which we called the, the suspender. And the, the to, and when you, when you call from WebAssembly into JavaScript, you present this token to the API. And um, that token told the system how much of your application to suspend and this 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 was in this is potentially an issue when you've got a sandwich scenario so you have you call into webassembly call back into javascript you call back into webassembly and then you call to do something that suspends and you have a choice at that point you can you do you want to suspend the the innermost call or do you want to spend the entire chain uh, and this caused a fair amount of confusion and also turned out that uh, with some slight tweaking of how we interpreted things, we could sort of fix on you only, you're only permitted to suspend the innermost call to, to WebAssembly. And so given that, when you, when you suspend, you know exactly that the system, the API knows exactly how much of the code to suspend. And the, what the result of that will be that if you do have that case where you want to suspend across multiple um, instances, then you're going to suspend multiple times. So it's it's you know you suspend in a, innermost, and then that will cause another suspension, and so on. It would still work out. It wouldn't affect the it wouldn't affect the the results that you are returned, but it does affect how they're returned. So it affects, you know, if you got it will it, the result would be multiple. In the current design, you have multiple promises effectively chained to each other. Um, but it was felt that the simpler design was just significantly easier to 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 think about for, from the application point of view, and tooling was also easier. Makes sense. Yeah, JavaScript developers are pretty used to chained promises, anyways. So it makes makes sense that this uh, simpler design then would be the one that that was winning. So just looking back at the initial when you proposed this, was this uh, an easy run, or was this kind of uh, hard to convince the other community members uh, of? How how did that go? That's an interesting story. So the very beginning, we were focusing on doing um, what we call core stack switching. And we were having a fair amount of uh, fair amount of uh, difficulty with that. Um, the so, but but someone noticed that there was this subcase of stack switching, which is connected to JavaScript and, and connecting the doing you know, doing the bridge between JavaScript and WebAssembly, which the people working on, including myself, working on core stack switching, weren't really paying attention to. But actually, from a business point of view, from a user user point of view, this this sort of subcase uh, represented a huge opportunity, and so it was very it was it was actually quite easy to get people to 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 adopt this as a split this off as a as a separate project. And there was very little pushback on it, to be honest. People really pre appreciated it. Um, it's taken a long time to, from that point where we decided to do it to today, mostly because 
it's hard, right? We're, we're doing something to V8 that it's really not set up for. <laughs> the internals of this, uh, the implementation, and all of the all of the imp, you know all of the side effects and the change in uh, the different kinds of assumptions that 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 our code, the v Google code, and Chrome and V8 itself have made. All of that was t has turned out to be much more difficult than uh, maybe not m than anticipated, but definitely very difficult to do. Got it. So um, stage three means implementation has started, and you just said um, you were sort of uh, forcing V8 into doing something that it was not designed for. Yeah. Can you talk about the other browsers a bit? Like uh, how does uh, Mozilla implement this? Uh, what about WebKit? Did they run into similar um, problems with their WebAssembly, JavaScript engines, or like how did it go for them? So Mozilla has an implementation in the nightly build. They don't. They haven't released it yet, uh, nor nor have we released it. Um, <clears throat> so you can you can try it on on in Firefox in the nightly build, not on the dev build or the or the main build. Um, <clears throat> I think the they started work on it much later than we did, so they had the advantage of knowing how. Uh, knowing how the, you know to avoid some of the pitfalls that we had, um, so they have uh, they, they have an implementation already. Um, we're actually very very close to stage four at this time, so we anticipate being able to go to stage four um, September October that kind of thing. And the things that are blocking us now are not. Are not implementation issues at all, but getting the specification correct, making sure all of the boxes are ticked. And um, you mentioned uh, Mozilla. Any any news about WebKit? Do you know if WebKit are implementing this? They have expressed interest, but they don't have the resources at the moment. To, as far as I know, they don't. They they're not working on it at the moment. I see. So looking at WebAssembly garbage collection, I think Igalia was involved in helping implement this in WebKit as well. So maybe this is. Uh, the route that they will take for JSPI as well. Who knows? Um, but yeah, you, you mentioned people can try this in Chrome and actually people can try this in Chrome with real users. So in Chrome, there's this concept of uh, origin trials and there's a running origin trial that started uh, a couple of weeks ago and it's running until February, 2025. Actually, I need to correct that. It, it's running until November, isn't it? Oh, November. Okay. Yes. I thought I looked it up on the page, but. There's so, okay. There was some confusion there, so we don't anticipate it running until February. It'll probably run until November. I see. Um, but like, can you tell us a bit more about the use cases that, that you see for JSPI? Is there a Google project that is using this or planning to use this, or a big Google partner that you can talk about? Um, like, any, any insights into how is the origin trial going? Who is using it? Um, what are we seeing so far? So there's currently about 85 uh, people who have registered for the origin trial. So a lot of them we don't have any direct knowledge of. We don't know really what they're doing. Um, <clears throat> the uh, on the Google front, uh, I think that there are several there are several partners who are interested in have been trying uh, JSPI. So Google Meet is trying it at the moment. Uh, Google Earth is trying it, <clears throat> and Google Maps is also trying it. Uh, and there's also, um, the, yeah, I'm not entirely sure the, the, which team is involved, but there are also ML um, people who are who are using it. So those, the ML and Google Earth and and so on, they they're using it for for dynamically loading <clears throat> uh, assets, things like map data. Google Meet is using it, or hopes to be using it, to access the access the web GPU APIs, which are primarily asynchronous. So that's the actually the classical original use of of JSPIs to access these asynchronous APIs. All right. So the way developers use this today um, is that there is um, an asynchronous method that I want to pass from JavaScript into Wasm. So in order to do so, they need to wrap it in WebAssembly.suspending and then pass it the function. Um, and the other way around, they need to use WebAssembly.promising. Can you just uh, tell us a little bit more 
what what these do. Like they they're new WebAssembly JavaScript interfaces that people um, in the context of this proposal have been adding to um, the standards. So WebAssembly.suspending, WebAssembly.promising. What what do both actually do? They do different things. So it may be easier to talk about the promising first. Hmm? Promising takes a takes a, a WebAssembly function that you've already instantiated, you've already exported from a, a, an instantiated module, and creates a new function from that from that that fun, from that WebAssembly function, and that new function will do this: create a promise and resolve the promise when the WebAssembly function is is returned. The other one, the suspending. Um, it's it's different. What has to happen is slightly different to the promising side. The the when we instantiate a, a module, we have to mark some of the imports as being these special imports, these suspending imports. So WebAssembly dot suspending doesn't do anything to the to its argument. It's simp it's a simply a flag that's used by uh, module dot instantiate. So that when you do when you do import these functions, the call to the call from WebAssembly into the import will be different. So the the it's not a it's not a symmetric API and it's also not a symmetric operation. What goes on? Um, <clears throat> the way that we've specified uh, module instantiation in WebAssembly makes it very very uh, it makes it slightly challenging to to have a prop, to have this uh, smooth. But but this is going to be taken care of in 99% of cases by the tool chain. So if you're using scripting, then you just you just use uh, minus you know use um, minus J, minus SJSPI, and you don't know what's going on. In fact, it's very very smooth if you if you're using M script and yeah, I think that's that's the case with many of these uh, proposals that the tools tool chains will just take care of it. The explainer actually has a really good example where they implement a really uh, funny way of uh, the Fibonacci number function yeah. in a way that it calls into asynchronous JavaScript in order to do the addition. So it does just a promise dot resolve and then it uh, adds the two numbers together. And um, yeah, if you look at the the way this works, it's like, oh my god, um, this is really a stupid way to implement uh, Fibonacci, but it's very illustrative just because it goes from all the different angles at the problem, from how you use this, how you compile this, to eventually then how you as a developer can work with this. Um, we will have a, a link to the um, to the explainer in the show notes with all the details on how you can play with this yourself. Um, there's a complete uh, yeah example that you can just pass into your mscript and local a local instance and then just compile it and yeah out comes uh, jspi jspromified um, yeah function um, that you can then just run and work with. Nice. Um, so you mentioned assets before and um, the dynamic loading of assets and um, one of the unexpected side effects, maybe at least for me, of JSPI is that it sort of can enable something that in the JavaScript world I would call a dynamic import. So you can lazily load code only the moment it is requested, it is, it is needed. Um, can you explain how this works? Like what, what does it do? What, what does it use there in order to load code lazily? There's already uh, a function in in the toolchain uh, code split, which allows you to break up a WebAssembly module into pieces, and uh, have them have them loaded asynchronously. And the idea is that that if you if you do that, then then a subsidiary code will when it eventually does get loaded, it will patch back into your main module so that once once all of that once that patching is done from the c code point of view the the webassembly code point of view you're just calling a function and you don't know what's going on it's as though there was no split there at all mm -hmm. there's a couple of issues with the standard code split because we're doing this asynchronous loading it has to be run from a worker we can't run it from the from the main thread and, and then you get into a problem if you've got a WebAssembly program that you are calling from the main thread and and the, the function that you were trying to load hasn't loaded yet, then there's a question of what to do at that point. 
So you can use JSPI at that boundary between sandwich between the call to your split off function and the actual split off function. You put a little sandwich in the middle there. And what that will do is it will check to see if the function has been loaded or not. And if it hasn't, it will force load it. But, but because you're not allowed to suspend on the main thread, uh, well, you're not, sorry, because you're not allowed to block the main thread, it will suspend your, your code and you will get woken up again when, when, when the subsidiary module has loaded. So this is a, it's, it's a functionality that already exists, but at the moment, because of the constraints on running, uh, uh, because the constraints on blocking the main thread, you can't really use code split. <clears throat> the, the the pure form of code split you can't use it on the main thread but what jspi allows you to do is to use code split on the main thread so this allows you to split off the 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 loading of your code into smaller pieces and typically what will happen actually hopefully is that you'll never use the jspi bit if you sort of think if you if you in parallel in the background fire off the loading of the other modules and they will load before the first call into those into those uh, dynamically loaded modules you'll never see anything it will it will just be totally transparent but the, the, having the jspi bit in the middle there is important for the fallback case where you haven't it wasn't fast enough and this solves a very substantial problem. If you've got if you've got a large uh, you've got a large WebAssembly module, uh, you don't want to you don't want and and you you have this problem of either waiting for the for the entire module to be loaded at once or doing some fairly tricky engineering to load the load it in pieces. And uh, this is actually, I mean, this is true for both JavaScript and WebAssembly. You have large WebAssembly programs, you have large JavaScript programs. But WebAssembly programs tend to be larger than JavaScript programs, simply because WebAssembly is lower level. I think there's a couple of reasons. One is WebAssembly is lower level, and the other is that the kinds of things that you're doing tends to be larger. The reason you're using WebAssembly is to have a, access to legacy code. So... Uh, the problem of the, of loading code for the first time is very important because because you want your web you want your website to be responsive and uh, and quick to load. So you can use JSPI to implement the equivalent of DLL load, um, <clears throat> but uh, it it. It does have a slight side effect on your application because it means that the top level entry to your to your application has to be via an async call. So you're calling from when the original call from JavaScript into your application is an async call. But uh, this kind of code split scenario was not was actually thought of as an application of JSPI from the very beginning. It was not not it was not. It was uh, def part of the part of, part of the justification for it, if you will. Well, that's interesting because honestly, to me, it looks more like a fun hack that someone discovered is actually useful and realizable with this proposal. But that's interesting to know that it was uh, inspect uh, in, uh, incepted from the from the beginning. We have a very simple example of how this works in the V8 blog that we've linked to in the show notes, so you can see what this is all about. I'm interested in. Your opinion on if you position this against another stage three proposal that we have, which is uh, the WebAssembly modules integration with uh, ES, uh, the ES modules way of loading code. Do you think this will then still be needed, or do you think um, the ES module way of loading code dynamically, or at, like in modules as the name suggests, will replace this? No, I, I think JSPI will be used inside, in within within the realization of the, that proposal. So I think they work together. I don't think I don't think they're competitive at all. Integration of ES modules uh, with WebAssembly modules is kind of tricky, uh, and there's been a fair number of sort of twists and turns in that particular story. Um, primarily because of the semantics of the module, you know, in when you when you implement when you're importing JavaScript, 
you get one thing, uh, but with with uh, WebAssembly, you can re you can instantiate the module multiple times, and this is a key part of the key part of WebAssembly, but it is different to JavaScript. So that semantic gap between importing uh, a, a WebAssembly module and a JavaScript module is is remains. And so the, the, the new proposal for uh, loading sources, I believe it is called, or source load f from in ESM connects to the, to the story. So I, I think they're not at all competitive. They work with, with each other. Hmm. Yeah, so I guess the reason why a lot of people, including me, are interested and very excited about this actually in practice is the potential for this to then be included with the way bundlers see code. So they could see the JavaScript code and the WebAssembly code at the same time and make um, yeah smart decisions based on what they see. So they could see from this massive uh, WebAssembly module, actually only, I don't know, uh, nine of the 10 uh, exposed functions are actually being used from the JavaScript side. And then vice versa, you could then also from the JavaScript side be smarter about um, the WebAssembly side and see what, what code you actually need to uh, include and then bundle maybe different WASM modules together into one big bigger file. I want to quickly talk about um, how a lot of the big JavaScript, uh, sorry, the big WASM applications work these days. So if you look at, for example, Flutter, they load a big uh, blob of WebAssembly beforehand, um, so before you can actually work with the application. So if you look at Flutter applications on the web, they tend to yeah, load slowly, and then once they are loaded, performance is, is excellent thanks to WebAssembly garbage collection. But then, like, um, do you foresee any of the uh, JavaScript promise integration to uh, have an impact on the way, for example, the Flutter team loads their code? Do you think there's potential for optim optimization there? Uh, I would hope so. Um, at the moment, Flutter does not use JSPI. They did do an experiment with it. It was a rather heroic experiment with it. Um, but I would imagine that when JSPI does finally ship, they will use they will use it. Um, there are additional issues with doing code split that have yet to be resolved. So there are there are internal limitations in 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 WebAssembly. For example, you can only have a hundred thousand imports, and if you've got a <laughs> It sounds like a lot, but yeah. <laughs> it sounds like a lot, but if you have a million functions, then there in your in your large WebAssembly application, then uh, then then this leads into trouble. So yeah, I wouldn't. I would anticipate when when uh, when JSPI lands and you know people become more familiar with using it, then more and more people will use it for this kind of code splitting effort. Yeah. Yeah, I do anticipate that. I I wasn't really aware of the the blob at the beginning of Flutter, but it doesn't surprise me. Yeah, um, I mean it's it's just something that I observed um, when it, when I use Flutter applications. The the loading generally is a little bit challenging, but then yeah, once once they are loaded, the performance is is really good. Um, so I want to talk about another proposal that you're championing, which is uh, called stack switching. It's very, very early on in the standardization process. It's at stage one. Can you tell us, maybe without going into too much of the nitty gritty details, what, what this proposal is about? What is what is stack switching? So this is what we call, internally, we call this core stack switching. And this really, uh, the, the this is solving a different problem than JSPI. So JSPI is about this integration between legacy code and, and the web, okay? But core stack switching is about how do you bring a language that has coroutines in it onto into WebAssembly? How do you do that? So in fact, um, uh, Dart, which is the basis uh, underneath Flutter and Kotlin are two, two languages that we're very interested in this. And both of these languages have uh, have coroutine capabilities in them. So if a simple example is the yield, what's called the yield style generator, and you want to, and you, at the moment, the, if you, if you have a yield style generator in either Kotlin or, or Dart, 
then what, in order to implement that in WebAssembly, what you have to do is you have to transform that generator into, into uh, uh, if you will, special code uh, so that it can run uh, uh, synchronously on on your in, in WebAssembly. But what core stack switching will let you do is it will let you run any function as a generator function. Another big example is Golang's kind of go routines, that kind of idea. Golang's go routines or or Swift, um, a, uh, the Swift actor model. They're all examples of co routine kind of capabilities in 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 these languages. And at the moment, there's a huge a huge problem in bringing any of those to WebAssembly. And that is that WebAssembly doesn't have the ability to suspend computation and resume it. So, so core stack switching is about extending WebAssembly itself to allow to allow coroutine languages which are naturally coroutining to allow to have a good path for compiling them uh, onto into WebAssembly. Hmm. So just to clarify, you're talking about go without the exclamation mark here, right? Right. I, I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I tend to use the phrase go lang when I'm referring to, to, to the Sorry. Google's I, could, I couldn't resist. Um, no, but I, I want to I wanna just make uh, the comparison here to JavaScript because I think some of this is uh, comparable to how it works in JavaScript. So if you have uh, async generators in, um, uh, in JavaScript and you transpile them down, um, it can still work, so the code still works, but it gets gets a lot longer than if you look at the actual original um, async generator function, for example. So if you open the bubble playground and then just paste in an async generator and then uh, transpile it down to something that can run on all the browsers, you can see that the, ma the code gets massively blown up. So I think this is when you say um, it can work today um, without having stack switching in WebAssembly, but it's uh, just going to take a lot more yeah, work to actually do the same job. So, is this a fair comparison, or would you say this is this is uh, not really working out the same way? It is. Uh, it goes further than that, though. So, so in JavaScript and in uh, in languages like Python too, when you have when you have yield lang yield generators, if you like, embedded in the language, there are syntactic restrictions on those languages. So. So the yield style generator in in JavaScript, for example, uh, you have to. Yeah, it's a very special function that acts as that acts as your generator. Um, on the other hand, if you want to do the same thing in 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 a functional language, then then your approach to it would be rather different. If you want to do generators in a in a in a functional language. Uh, so, for example, you want to iterate over the elements of a recursive tree. So there are, are already several functions available in many functional languages, most functional languages, to allow iteration over a tree. And what you want to do is you want to use those same iteration functions, but as a, as a generator. So you, the way you do it in there is you pass, you take the regular functions, but you pass in a special function that as the yield operator. So this is this cannot be done uh, straightforwardly in a syntactic uh, uh, re reformulation. We generally call these trans transformations uh, CPS transforms or continuation passing style transforms. That's what we call them. And you can do a CPS transform e even in the functional language scenario, but it becomes it becomes very slow and very uh, and very large in code size. It can double the it can more than double the code size and it can more than halve the performance. So what core stack switching allows us to do is to basically run these generator type uh, applications generator type functions at full speed that that's the idea gotcha so uh, i looked at the explainer a bit and um it talks about various ways how this is implemented in different programming languages and um it attempts to find a common like smallest common denominator approach how this could be implemented but looking at the explainer right now it seems like there's even today two ways of approaching this can you just briefly introduce the two ways how like how people approach this 
there's some news on this front. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so half the press, if you will. <laughs> so going forward, we're going to have a single integrated approach. What will happen is we will be taking what's called the WASM FX uh, proposal and extending it with bag of stacks. There were these two proposals. One was very minimal bag of stacks and one was rather elaborate, the WASM FX. And what we're going to do is combine the two, so get the best of both worlds. Um, so there will be, it, it's still kind of hot off the press. The, 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 the technicalities are not fully worked out yet, but that is, the, that is how we're going to be moving forward. So we'll, there will be one, one design going forward. And the design will be based on what's called typed continuations. So if you think about JSPI for a second, then you have you have this sort of entry into the into the promising function and the egg and the call into the suspending function. So there's an, an analog of that in type continuations, but we're not calling from JavaScript into WebAssembly more anymore. It's just WebAssembly to WebAssembly. So you have a call into a sus potentially suspending function. That call is slightly different to a normal call, um, but and but it allows that it allows that function to suspend uh, and then be resumed later on. So this is important for compiler writers much more than your, your average developer. If you're if you're a compiler writer, you want to figure out how to bring how to bring your language into the world of coroutining. Um, so that that's that that's the core stack switching is really addressing that that, and it also should be said that we're not talking about legacy code anymore. Uh, the there isn't a huge um, backlog of C plus plus code that relies on coroutining. Uh, there are some, but there's not a huge amount of it. Uh, this is really about more modern languages, more, which are designed to be responsive from the beginning, and how we bring those into WebAssembly. And this also, I think, kind of marks a, a little bit of a paradigm shift in WebAssembly. So it started maybe as this thing where you wanted to port something that existed over to the web um, with ASM.js, ASM.js, but then later, obviously, WebAssembly. And um, now the, nowadays, um, people start writing, I don't know, th things in Rust to begin with that they know that they will be using on various platforms or Kotlin because they want to get this uh, multi-platform um, yes, um, effects there um, where you can just write once and run anywhere. So yeah, I think this positioning as, as legacy code, yeah, as I said, it's, it's no longer really the case in many, many instances there and um, people start writing with modern programming languages and expect them to work performantly on the web as well once they're right. compiled to WebAssembly. Cool. So thank you very much for sharing those uh, those exciting updates here and um, for yeah the hot of the press insights into the stack switching proposal. Um, also wishing you the best for moving the JSPI proposal to stage four pretty soon, which is something that you alluded to. But um, before we close, I just want to move to the final section of the show, which is, uh, as always, VASM, but not. So Francis, when you instantiate streaming on any of your streaming devices, what is it that you currently watch or listen to? Uh, at home, we've been watching a lot of Japanese crime shows on Netflix and related uh, streaming services. So uh, translate subtitles, obviously, I can't understand the Japanese, hmm. but uh, but a very interesting, very different to American uh, TV shows. Anything in concrete that you can recommend for someone who is new to the genre? So the one that got me started is one called Vivant. Um, and uh, I don't think there's, it's a sort of a limited series of about 10 episodes. And um, I don't think there's an analog equivalent of it anywhere else in the canon i've never seen anything like it so and it's a it's a it's a it has many surprises and twists i'm not going to surprise i'm not going to spoil the surprise <laughs> but i do recommend it it's very very uh intriguing show 
All right. I will check it out and see if it's on my European Netflix. It might be not because sometimes Netflix is not Netflix everywhere on the globe. But um, you said Vivant, so I will, I will check this out. Yeah, v V-I-V-A-N-T. Nice. And then the final question in the WebAssembly but not section is, if there is anything that you could local get and then global set onto the world, so local get as in something that you, that you do, and then global set in a sense that you wish everyone else did, what would it be? I'm not sure I wish everyone would do this, but... <laughs> like most of the people. One of the things that I've been working... Not working, <laughs> it does feel like work sometimes. <laughs> I've become very interested in making coffee, uh, getting, getting, get, understanding all the different ways in which coffee is made, and and getting the getting the the taste of it right, and so on. It turns out to be at least as difficult as getting as wine tasting when you. Oh yes. And so super surprising to me, it's very simple changes like the temperature of water makes a big difference to the taste. So I. I've been interested in making coffee for a while, but I've really gotten deeper into it, the rabbit hole recently. So, you know, uh, coffee is not just something that you the, the it's it's a lot more to it. There's a lot more potential to it than than just uh, getting it from the local um, <coughs> commodity shop. And I've, actually, it's interesting now. I find it hard to drink coffee from a place like Starbucks. It, just doesn't, it doesn't have a very much, doesn't have a very interesting taste. Yeah, once you've looked behind the curtain, there's no way you ever could go back. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I could definitely live in a world that has the coffee in a way that I like it. <laughs> All right, cool. So thank you very much, Francis. Um, finally, for people who want to work um, with you, maybe look at the stuff you do, um, or just essentially follow the, the things you do, but what can they do? Can they email you? Can they can they follow you somewhere on the social networks? Do you use GitHub? I don't do uh, social most social networks. Um, I, I would recommend that I do do have other things that I'm going that I'm working on in in GitHub. So you can look at, look me up on in GitHub. Um, so I'm continue my work in programming language design, for example, beyond the. Beyond the, uh, the the WebAssembly side of things, um, so yeah, GitHub is one place that I would I would suggest looking. Perfect. And before entering the show, I actually looked at your GitHub and um, I found the Go exclamation mark uh, repository. So yeah, maybe maybe someone ports it um, in a way that it can run on WebAssembly. This would be nice. So I'll suggest closing the story with your inner piece that you made with Google. <laughs> and with that, yeah, thank you very much, Francis, for coming on the show. Um, it was a blast. And um, yeah, see you and listen to you next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you for having me.